great thing about presenting a TEDx talk is you get to present your crazy ideas about how to solve all the world's problems. And in TEDx tradition, I'll start with a story. So I was 10 years old at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And it terrified me, because I thought there was really a chance that we would have a nuclear war and the world would come to an end. In school, we had air raid drills. And siren would go off, and you'd have to crawl under the desk. They called it duck and cover. You have to know that I grew up in New York. And being the New York wise guy that I am, even at 10 years old, I said to my teacher, look, if they drop even a single bomb on the Empire State Building, we'll be vaporized. The air raid drills are useless. <laughs> and my teacher's response was, get under the desk, kid. <laughs> at that moment, I realized that adults didn't know what they were doing. And when I look at the headlines today, I have the same impression. <laughs> the discussion about the crisis on TV seemed insane to me. Nobody had any reasonable way out. Um, the behavior of political leaders is that once they perceive a threat, they make a threat back. And then once they make that threat back, they feel like they're obligated to at least be willing to carry out that threat to preserve their credibility. So it seemed like they were marching lockstep into disaster. Nobody really thought America and Russia really wanted to have a nuclear war. We find this kind of paradox in a lot of problems in our society. Nobody says they want war, but again and again, we have wars. Nobody advocates poverty, but poverty endures. We have this great democracy, but the Democrats and the Republicans can't agree on the best policy any more than the Yankees and the Red Sox can agree on who has the best baseball team. I'm here to ask the same question that Rodney King, who was a victim of police brutality in 1991, famously asked. Why can't we all just get along? That's the fundamental question. And that's the title of a new book that I'm writing with my co-author, Christopher Fry. Go to whycantwe.org. Much later, I was a math major at MIT. And I learned that this particular trap had a name. It was called The Prisoner's Dilemma. And the Prisoner's Dilemma is a mathematical model of the trade-off between cooperation and competition. The dilemma comes in when you realize that there are certain situations where if you just look at your own narrow point of view, you'll make a decision to compete. But if everybody makes that same decision, everybody loses. So what you have to do is you have to step back from the situation, look at the bigger picture, and then you can decide to cooperate. And that's what happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy and um, Khrushchev felt like they had to compete for who had the scariest threat. And what they risked was the total loss of nuclear war. Now, in science, when we face these dilemmas, we don't get upset. We ask the question, what does the trade-off depend on, and can we influence it in any way? And I also studied evolutionary theory. And I realized that one of the key factors in the trade-off is the relative scarcity and abundance of resources. And here's why. If, there's not, if you have scarcity, there's not enough to go around, so people have to fight over what little there is. But the problem is that fight itself uses up resources, so there's less for everybody, and you get this vicious circle. Okay? Let's consider the other side. Suppose people decide to cooperate. Well, two heads are better than one. You get synergy. Um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So that creates more abundance. So we have a virtuous cycle. So that's where we are. We're always on this knife edge between the vicious cycle and the virtuous cycle. So it's real simple. If we want the world to be more cooperative, we just end scarcity. But that kind of sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? Or does it? My scientific work is in artificial intelligence. And we've long had the dream that 
if people don't want to do work, do work for themselves, we can have a robot do it. So today, you might be worried that you lose your job to a robot. But tomorrow, if that robot is working for you, and, what, and it means that you don't need a job, well, that might eliminate a lot of worry. There's another part of the picture. My co-author, Fry, is an enthusiast for 3D printers. And when he first started talking to me about 3D printers, I thought, OK, they print out these cute little plastic tchotchkes. So what? <laughs> but advances are very, very fast in this. And now you could imagine a 3D printer printing out a car or a house. Yesterday, we heard a talk about a food computer, a little hydroponic farm in, in a, a box. And if we have those, then anybody could make food anywhere in the world. So we could print out the parts for a food computer. But the most amazing thing that a 3D printer could print out would be a 3D printer. <laughs> so then, if you have a 3D printer and your neighbor doesn't have one, well, no big deal. You just print out one. So now we have the ingredients for a new economy. AI is the software. 3D printers are the hardware. And that's what it's going to be in the future. So in capitalism, capital owns the means of production. In communism, the government owns the means of production. In what we call makerism, everybody owns the means of production. And in that way, we can get cutthroat competition out of the economy. OK, now we've solved the economy. Let's start to think about government. <laughs> How do we get competition and power out of government? OK, well, first we might look around and say, do we have any examples in our society where a group successfully governs itself without hierarchies, without power, without competition? And I think we do. Now, my tribe is the scientific community. And if you think about it, it's really a marvel. Okay? So scientists are smart, but there's only, they're only a small percentage of the population. They don't even spend that much money considering the magnitude of the problems that they're dealing with. And yet, they produce breakthroughs that improve our lives on a regular basis. And if you hang out with scientists uh, like I do, you know that they don't always agree on everything. So how do we do it? And I think the key is scientists organize themselves for cooperation rather than competition. Now, there are tenure battles. There's battles for funding. Scientists have big egos. It's all true. Okay? But to me, that's a sideshow. That's not science. What that is, is the business and politics of having jobs in science. And it's like, not surprisingly, it's like the business and politics of having jobs anywhere. Okay? But when all the bureaucrats are out of the room, what do scientists do? They make theories. They make hypotheses. They do analysis. They do simulation. And those are ideas we could bring into government. Right now, our government is mostly about who gets to make a decision. And what it should be about is, what's the best decision for everybody? So Fry and I are working on a new proposal for government that we call reasonocracy. And I'll just give you a little flavor of it. Okay? So in America, we hold the idea of voting to be sacred. You know? But like in the scientific community, we don't have any voting. In fact, we don't really even have many of the trappings that business and government tell us is necessary to get things done. Okay? There's no president of science. There's no CEO of science. There's no, um, there's no stockholders, no political parties, and very little voting. So suppose instead we chose people at random, representatives at random, like jury duty. We, 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 right now, we ask juries to make life and death decisions. Okay? But that would get money out of the selection. And, but of course, we'd have to couple that with some education to make sure the representatives knew what they were doing. And I, I think the number one thing
thing in the curriculum should be learning how to cooperate, teach them modern conflict resolution and consensus building methods. And we don't have to do it all just by people talking in a meeting. We can have online tools that they didn't think of 200 years ago when they made the Constitution. We could have crowdsourcing for brainstorming. We could have um, uh, online tools that help us keep track of uh, the dependencies among ideas, what's pro and what's con. And we could do what if scenarios, um, just like a spreadsheet. And Fry and I are working on some such tools in our research work. So I'm a starry-eyed idealist. And people say to me, oh, you scientists, you think everything's a technical problem. But you couldn't solve things like cooperation and competition, which are timeless social problems. But I think science can. I think that science can help remove pressures like scarcity that make people act out of fear. And fear is what prevents us from building the culture of empathy and compassion that we need. So when frightened little 10-year-old Henry poked his head out from under the desk during the Cuban Missile Crisis, his fourth grade teacher couldn't have taught him all this. We didn't have AI or 3D printers. The book that popularized The Prisoner's Dilemma wasn't even published until the 1980s. I don't want there ever to be another air raid drill in a fourth grade classroom. I want fourth graders to learn about the fundamentals of computation, the mathematics of cooperation. So Rodney, why can't we all just get along? It's because society doesn't understand the truth about the trade-off between cooperation and competition yet. Thank you. <laughs>